Hello friends, this is Stephen Cook, and I'm returning today on our continued study on angels and demons, and today we're going to be moving into the subject of Satan's strategies uh, that he employs to defeat God's people. This will probably be two, maybe three lessons, I suspect. It depends on, on uh, how many rabbit trails that we chase down. Um, by the way, I'm going to recommend two books for you. Uh, one I have a hard copy of, the other one I don't, but I'll recommend it. Um, but this one is called The Strategy of Satan, How to Detect and Defeat Him by Dr. Warren Wearsby. A short read, powerful read. Please get this for your library. Going to recommend this very strongly. It will be a blessing to you, I promise. The other book is going to be uh, written by Dr. Renald Showers called What on Earth is God Doing? And it shows what God is doing from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning of time to the creation of the new heavens and new earth. And uh, what I love about Dr. Showers in his brilliance is he goes through and he talks about Satan's attacks along the way uh, to try to disrupt God's plans to advance his own agenda. And, uh, and of course, in the end, God wins. He has to win. He's God. He cannot fail. But Dr. Showers does an absolutely brilliant job in that book and really going to recommend that very strongly. There will be links in the description below to both of those books, so please chase that down. Now, a few lessons back in our study on angels and demons, we uh, jumped into Satanology and we talked about how the first sin that took place took place in heaven by a creature uh, by the name of Lucifer, who was an angel of the class of cherubim. And how, at a moment in time, he corrupted his reason because of his pride. And in his corrupted state, in his corrupted reasoning, he sought to set his will against the will of God. And he sought to rule in God's place, is what he's desiring to do. And Satan convinced a third of the angels to follow him in his rebellion, and how he created the kingdom of darkness at that time. But Satan's kingdom of darkness uh, was expanded to include the earth when we see him coming into the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, and he's already a fallen creature at that time. But he comes into the Garden of Eden, and he tempts the first humans, Adam and Eve, to set their will against the will of God. And remember from previous lessons, I'm being very brief here, uh, but from previous lessons, God had created Adam and Eve to serve as theocratic administrators over the earth. And we looked at Genesis chapters 1 and 2 where God had given them the mandate to rule over the earth, and God had given Adam and Eve the title deed of the earth, as it were. And so when Adam and Eve set their will against the will of God and they submitted themselves to Satan, they handed the title deed of the earth over to him at that time, and Satan took possession of the earth. And as people began to multiply and cities began to form and nations began to develop upon the earth, Satan was ruling over these cities and nations. This is why in Isaiah 14, when it talks about how he has weakened the nations, or Revelation, when it talks about how he deceives the nations, uh, that's really quite revealing. 1 John 5.19 talks about how the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The scope of Satan's influence and control is quite staggering. But it helps us to understand the state of affairs and the corruption that we see going on in the world that has been going on, is going on, and will be going on as long as Satan continues to function as the ruler of this world. And he is the ruler of this world. Three times in the Upper Room Discourse in the Gospel of John, three times Jesus referred to Satan as the ruler of this world. Now, uh, Satan is limited in his influence, in his powers and abilities, and he's limited for a period of time. So he's, he's restrained as far as what he can do, uh, both in ability and for duration in time. And Satan will eventually be cast into the lake of fire. He has been judged, he's guilty, and he will be punished. But that um, sentencing is, uh, is pending. It will occur, but it is pending at the moment. But Satan is nonetheless the ruler of this world. Now remember, Satan is a creature. He's finite. Uh, God is omniscient. He uh, knows all things. He's omnipresent. He's equally and fully everywhere all the time. And um, he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's able to accomplish all that he desires. So God is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. Satan is a creature. He's limited. He's like you and me. He's limited in, in his intellect, in his will, in his uh, ability to be present. And so he must rely on other creatures. He must rely on fallen angels. We know them to be evil spirits, demons. He also relies on uh, unbelievers. 
uh, who are saturated with human viewpoint to operate according to his agendas. And Satan, to some degree, operates through immature, carnal Christians to accomplish his will in the world as well, and I've talked about that before. So Satan must rely upon others. Satan has created certain systems. He's created a world system. Uh, upwards of 180 times the word cosmos is used in the uh, Greek New Testament. And the vast majority of those occurrences tell us that this refers to Satan's world system. This is why 1 John 2, 15 and 16 tells us, Do not love the world nor the things in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But Satan has created a world system, and that is his system of values and philosophies which he promotes to advance his particular agenda. Those values and philosophies are communicated to us in our, uh, from our uh, political institutions, our academic institutions. It comes to us through uh, television, through radio, through literature, through music, oh boy, through lots of music, but through many channels. And at the heart of that is a directive in Satan's world system to operate independently of God. That is to operate by a set of values and philosophies that are contrary to God and his character and his values that are set forth in the Word of God. This is why I'm a biblicist. This is why I go to the Word of God, because the Word of God gives me that insight into who is God, what's going on in the world, and helps me and gives me a true assessment of the state of affairs, of why everything exists, who am I, what's going on. It's the only basis upon which I have uh, truth to make sense of the world and to make sense of what's going on around me. But to understand those values and philosophies that Satan promotes is part of his world system. Satan also has an inside agent. It's called the sin nature. This was acquired by our first parents, Adam and Eve, at the time of the fall. All of their children are born into this world with a sin nature, minus, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. But otherwise, all people are born with a sin nature, a proclivity to operate independently and in rebellion uh, uh, to God. As I mentioned before, if the devil were a broadcaster sending out his message into the world, the sin nature would be that internal receiver that is automatically tuned to his message. And so when we see those values and philosophies coming to us from worldly channels, again, whether that's through television or through literature or through music or through conversations or, or wherever it happens to come from, there's a part of us that resonates with that. And it is that fallen part of us that Satan has as an inside agent that, uh, again, resonates with those values and philosophies. So we fight on three fronts as Christians. We, we fight against the world, we fight against the flesh, and we fight against the devil. So we are being attacked on three fronts. And this is why I'm going into these things, to try to explain these things, to develop this, to get this uh, in the stream of our consciousness so that we're aware of this and we can make sense of what's going on in the world around us. So talking about Satan's strategies, let's get moving on this. So the Bible reveals that Satan is the enemy of God and he attacks his people. Peter warns us in 1 Peter 5, 8, he says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around uh, like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. By the way, all of my scripture quotes are going to be taken from the New American Standard Bible, 1995 update, unless otherwise noted. Now, in his efforts, Satan has strategies he sets forth to accomplish his purposes. A strategy is a plan of action that one creates and employs in order to achieve an objective. It's a plan of action. Look, we have plans of actions that we create in our families uh, when we think about, uh, you know, we have strategies for economics, for politics, uh, uh, businesses create strategies, uh, certainly in the military, uh, their uh, military leaders create strategies for success. And so a strategy is just simply a plan of action that one creates and employs in order to achieve an objective. What's Satan's major objective? Well, his major objective is to make himself like God and to rule in his place. Remember, we had talked in Isaiah 14 uh, how Satan was fallen. And he, the five I will statement saying, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. The stars of God there being a reference to angels. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. Satan can't be God, but he wants to make himself like God to rule in his place, to rule over his creation. But there is only one sovereign God, and he advances his own agenda, which cannot fail because he cannot fail. 
I love Isaiah 45, 5 and 6, where God says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. There's only one. God says, I will gird you, though you have not known me, that all men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. So one God, uh, and he wins. Now, Satan's desire, like his reasoning, remember, has been corrupted because of his pride. Uh, Ezekiel 7, uh, 28, 17 mentions that his heart was lifted up because of his beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. So Satan is not altogether reasonable. He operates from a basis of pride and power, and uh, when one operates from a basis of pride and power, one will employ reason to the degree that it supports power. But when power is threatened, reason is abandoned, and uh, all sorts of tyranny results. And by the way, I've met some very, very arrogant people, very prideful people. I've run into them in, in many different categories of life. Uh, and, uh, and, and when they operate that way, they'll be reasonable to a certain degree, but you threaten their power, and boy, they'll abandon reason in a second and resort to all sorts of bully tactics. Very unfortunate, but they're out there. Beware. Now, Satan has been advancing his agenda for millennia and has become very knowledgeable and skilled in what works. I love this quote here by Dr. Charles Ryrie from his book, Balancing the Christian Life. He says, By his very longevity, Satan has acquired a breadth and depth of experience which he matches against the limited knowledge of man. He has observed other believers in every conceivable situation, thus enabling him to predict with accuracy how we will respond to circumstances. And that is absolutely right. Let me say that again. So he has observed other believers in every conceivable situation, thus enabling him to predict with accuracy how we will respond to circumstances. Pardon me for one second there. He goes on to say, although Satan is not omniscient, his wide experience and observation of man throughout his entire history on earth give him knowledge which is far superior to anything any man could have, end quote. Uh, insightful comment there. Now, Satan attacks God's people in order to hinder spiritual growth and ministry. Satan wants to keep uh, Christians uh, as babies, as immature, as ignorant, does not want us to grow up, to become mature believers, to know who God is, what He's doing, uh, what uh, portfolio of spiritual assets the Lord has, reward, has, has awarded to us at the moment that we came into the family of God. Because, listen, when Satan created his kingdom of darkness, those that are born into this world are born under his authority. They are born in the domain of darkness. They are born into a slave market of sin. They are his. When we go forward with the gospel message and we uh, uh, tell people uh, who are lost, and we inform them that Christ died for them, that he was buried, that he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures, and that they will simply come and trust in Christ as Savior, that they can be liberated, that they can be rescued, they can be set free from Satan's slave market of sin. Colossians 1.13 tells us uh, that at the moment of faith in Christ, that he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the beloved Son. And so if Satan uh, can keep us ignorant or can employ strategies that can hinder us from our spiritual growth and ministry, then he can keep us from sharing the gospel with other people who will turn to faith in Christ. Because every time a person comes to faith in Christ, Satan loses, loses another uh, citizen of his kingdom, another, uh, another resident in his, in his kingdom. And so Satan is trying to hinder spiritual growth and ministry. And so he has various strategies that he employs. Now, Christians who are advancing spiritually and engaging in effective ministry, again, pose a threat to Satan's agenda. We pose a threat to Satan's agenda because when we go forth, when we are walking in the truth, when we are growing as God calls us to grow, when we are walking with God on a daily basis, then we are serving as lights in a dark world. And we are sharing the gospel, and we are sharing biblical truth, which liberates people. It sets people free from Satan, from his domain of darkness, and from his lies. And so it really becomes quite powerful, because we are disrupting Satan's kingdom. Make no mistake, we are disrupting Satan's kingdom. 
when we go forth with the gospel, when we go forth with the truth of God's word, when we live out biblical Christianity, we are a threat to him and to his world system. So he would really love to shut us down. Now, naturally, he will oppose our efforts and try to hinder us. Because Satan cannot touch God himself, he goes after his people, seeking to frustrate our efforts as best he can to frustrate us. And sometimes Satan is effective. Sometimes he is permitted to have his way. There's a very interesting passage in 1 Thessalonians where Paul wrote, he says, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in person, but not in spirit, were all the more eager with great desire to see your face. Notice what he says, for we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. And yet Satan hindered us. Isn't that interesting? Now, we're not sure why Satan was permitted to hinder Paul and his companions. We're not sure why. Uh, Though frustrated, Paul continued to seek the Lord and to minister where an open door presented itself. And so Paul... Uh, again, was frustrated, but he continued. I love the passage in Acts 14, 27. It says, When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And God will open doors. You see the same thing in Revelation 3, 8, where he says, uh, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. Which no one can shut. But an open door, and this is another interesting point here, an open door of ministry does not mean that there will not be opposition. I mean, some Christians think this way. They think, well, you know, it's just, you're not going to be met with any opposition. It's just going to be clear sailing all the way. In fact, uh, Christian ministry often means that there will be adversaries. Now, this is a wake-up call. And uh, look at 1 Corinthians 16, 8, and 9. Uh, Paul wrote, I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Did you catch that? Paul says, a wide door for effective ministry has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Thomas Constable, quoting here, he says, he says, We know that Satan is behind all our temptations, having received permission to assail us from God. He uses the world system and our flesh, that is our sinful nature, as his tools. And I mentioned that we spent lessons, uh, two lessons on the world and one on the flesh. But again, going back to Constable, he says, He uses the world system and our flesh as his tools. Uh, Constable goes on, he says, he also attacks us directly himself and through his angelic emissaries. God has given us specific instructions in Scripture about how to combat these attacks. We are to resist the devil. We are to resist the devil, to flee temptations of the world system, that is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, and to deny the flesh. Remember, we talked about that, about about um, how we are to make no provision for the flesh. We are to stop exposing ourselves to the things that excite the sin nature, the flesh. And so we are to deny the flesh. And he goes on here, he says, Satan has consistently aimed his personal attacks at getting people to doubt, to deny, to disrupt, and to disobey the revealed will of God. See, and I'm going to break here for a second, he wants, Satan wants to get us to operate independently of the Father and to not walk with him, to not walk in his will. Constable goes on, he says, uh, the world system seeks to get people to believe that they do not need God, but can get along very well without him. The flesh tempts us to think that we can find satisfaction, joy, and fulfillment on the physical, material level of life alone, end quote. Now, scripture advance means opposition. It does mean that. And you should expect it. Uh, You should expect that as you learn more about God and His will, and especially if you choose to walk in that, as you choose to walk in the will of God, that you can expect to be met with opposition. Uh, But nothing, but but even though we will be met with opposition, it's nothing more or beyond what God permits. It is nothing more or beyond what God permits. Uh, Listen, when God turns up the heat, he always keeps his hand on the thermostat. And so he's always in control of those uh, pressure moments in life. 
And, and so we're going to be met with uh, some opposition. That will happen, and God will permit that to happen. Now, the Christian who learns God's Word and lives by faith will have the greatest impact for God in this world. The Christian who learns God's Word and lives by faith will have the greatest impact for God in this world. Living by faith means we learn God's Word and consciously trust Him as we apply it to our lives. There's that process of learning and living because you cannot uh, live what you do not know, and knowledge of God's Word necessarily precedes living God's will. And so uh, we have to live by faith, but again, this means learning God's Word and consciously trusting Him uh, as we apply it to our lives. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Hebrews 10, 38 says, uh, but God here speaking, but my righteous one shall live by faith, shall live by faith. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So do you want to please God? Live by faith. Learn his word, walk in his word, obey it. Now, I think it's helpful for us to understand that God's Word is powerful. God's Word is powerful. A very fascinating section here in Isaiah 55, uh, where God says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And by the way, we'll talk more about getting into the thoughts, because the mind is the battleground. And let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion unto him on him and to and to our God for he will abundantly pardon because that's how how great our God is. Uh, Isaiah 55 8 God says for my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. But notice what he says in verse 10 for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without uh, watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. He says, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. The, when the word of God goes forth, it accomplishes exactly what God intends. It accomplishes exactly what God intends. And it is powerful. It is transformative. It is transformative. And that's one of the reasons, again, why I am a Bible teacher, because I just simply want to put the Word out there. I want to put the Scripture out there. Uh, look, the poodle doesn't need to defend the lion, okay? Uh, the lion can defend itself. And you put the Word of God out there, and and it will do what it does. It's alive. It's, a, it's powerful. It's very effective. In fact, that's what Hebrews 4.12 tells us. For the Word of God is living and active, it is living. Uh, the King James Version says it is alive and powerful. And that's exactly what it is. Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer, <laughs> which shatters a rock? Uh, when the word of God goes forth again, it accomplishes exactly what God intends it to do. Now, this is going to have varied results, and I've talked about this in other lessons, because there are some people whose hearts have become so calcified, so recalcitrant, so hardened, uh, that they sh have shut the Word of God out. And so the Word of God can, in some ways, even have a hardening effect. I think it was Spurgeon who coined the phrase, the same sun that softens wax hardens clay. That the same sun that softens wax hardens clay. And so... This, there's nothing wrong with the sun, it's what's the material that it falls on. Now, when a heart is positive to God, when a heart is positive to God and wants to know Him, wants to know His Word, then that Word will soften the heart. But when the heart is negative, uh, then it has a hardening effect. And so, I'm not responsible for outcomes, I'm responsible for output. Uh, the outcomes, that's, look, that's between you and God. However the Word falls upon you, that's, that's between you and the Lord. Uh, but again, that Jeremiah 23, 29, very great passage, is not my word like a fire declares the Lord and like a hammer which shatters a rock. So God's word is powerful. It is also transformative. It's also transformative. It transforms from the inside out. 
Uh, for example, Psalm 119, verse 9, David says, How can a young man keep his way pure? You see, if we if we pursue the pure life, if we pursue the life of devotion to the Lord, which is what we're called to pursue, of simplicity and devotion to Christ, uh, there, the question raises, how can a young man keep his way pure? Because of the sin nature and the temptations from without and from within, how do we do that? He says, by keeping it according to your word. Okay, see, now there's the standard. So the standard for purity in life is in accordance with the word of God. But notice verse 11. He says, your word have I treasured in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Your word have I treasured in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Because the more that we take the word of God in, the more the word of God gets into us, the more it will transform us from the inside out. It has that transformative effect from within. In John 17, 17, Jesus was praying in the upper room. This is on the night before his crucifixion. And he's praying to the Father in John 17, and he prays and he says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. So to be sanctified is to be set apart for purpose, for ministry. Um, And so he says here, sanctify them in the truth. And then he says, your word is truth. So the word of God is is what has that sanctifying effect. And that's why we get into the word. We want to know what the word says. And as we get into the word, the word gets into us and it begins to transform us. Again, I've talked about Psalm 1 where David says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, in the Torah, is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. And what's the benefit of that? He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, and his leaf does not wither, and in whatsoever he doeth, he prospers. I'm quoting that from memory because I memorized it from the King James. But that tree, that picture of a tree that's planted by, uh, by, a, by, by a river, and you can imagine the roots going down right into that river and just nourishing on that all the time. And that tree, whatever the environment is, that tree is going to be robust and strong and healthy and green and going to produce fruit. Uh, and fruit, by the way, is never for the tree's benefit. It's always for the benefit of others. But the, but the tree is going to grow strong. And so uh, the person who meditates on the Word of God day and night, who focuses, who thinks about, because biblical meditation is different than Eastern meditation. Eastern meditation says, empty your mind. Uh, biblical meditation is, fill your mind. Fill it with the Word of God. Become saturated in your thinking. Let it permeate all aspects of your thought and your life. But the more that you meditate upon the Word of God, you will be like that tree that's plugged into that river and just nourishing from that... Uh, life-giving water. And so it's it's that image is really quite powerful. And so not only is it powerful, not only is it transformative, but it moves the hearts of those who are positive to God. It moves the hearts of those who are positive to God. If you've never read the account of Jesus after the resurrection when he's walking on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, read that. It's a very insightful passage. And Jesus is walking with these two disciples. We don't know who they are, but he's walking with them and their eyes are blinded. They don't know who he is. And they're walking with him and they're having this discussion. And on this road to Emmaus, which was several miles, this would have been a couple hours journey for them to walk, oh, Jesus with these two disciples, he gives them a Bible lesson. And it's no doubt (laughs) probably one of the greatest Bible lessons in the history of the human race about him And notice what uh, Luke 24 tells us here. It says, then beginning with Moses, this is Jesus talking to the disciples, these two disciples, says, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Jesus is, is explaining the scriptures to them. He's explaining the scriptures to them as they walk along. And they get to their destination, and eventually they're having a meal together, and their eyes are open, and they see who Jesus is, and then Jesus disappears. But they start talking to each other, these two disciples. Don't miss this. I love this. And they're talking to one another, and they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? Were not our hearts burning within us? And listen, the heart that is positive to God will burn from within. I have 
my goodness, experienced this on so many occasions. You get into the Word of God, and it's exciting. And as they're listening to Jesus explain the Scriptures, as He's working through and He's explaining the Scriptures, all, all that, and they don't, again, they don't know who He is. They did not, all they had was the information of what He was telling them as He explains the Scriptures. But again, as they were recalling, their Bible lesson with Jesus on the road to Emmaus, again, they said, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us. So the word of God is is very transformative. And I'm bringing this up in this subject on Satan's strategies, not only so that we can know uh, uh, what Satan's strategies are, but so that we can defend ourselves, so that we can know who we are, and we can know the basis for truth and life and strength. And so that we can stand and have a, a, a purpose in this world, that we can operate from a personal sense of destiny, because we know we are God's children. We know the truth of His Word. We know what we have and who we are in Christ. And those blessings and that portfolio of spiritual assets that enables us to be able to, to live successfully in this world, so that we can be successful in this world. But it moves the hearts of those who are positive to God. Now, living by faith is the basis for renovating our thinking. It's the basis for renovating our thinking. I love Romans 12, 1 and 2, where Paul says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. A living sacrifice. This isn't like the dead sacrifice in the Old Testament that was a one-and-done deal. This is a lifetime. You are a living sacrifice. And don't wriggle off the altar. That's what we're tempted to do at times uh, when it gets tough. But we are to present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world. And to be conformed means that the pressures of the world seek to press you into its mold. But you are not to be conformed to this world. And so you, you have this ability to resist that, that, that conforming pressure. And how? From the inside. But be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Because that transformation is, a, is from the inside out, and so it strengthens you. And don't miss that it's in the renewing of your mind. Because prior to coming to faith in Christ, uh, what we have is we have a lifetime of human viewpoint. I mean, I remember when I was growing up in Southern California and in Las Vegas in the 80s, uh, I mean, I was in the ways of the world, and I was saturated with human viewpoint. Vegas will give it to you, trust me. Uh, but I took in the ways of the world from television, from literature, from music. Boy, did I listen to a lot of music, a lot of heavy metal and hard rock, and went to a lot of concerts. And But you get saturated with that. But when you come to faith in Christ, apart from the gospel, what do you know? Well, you don't know anything. You have a lifetime of human viewpoint. And so in order for you to grow up as a Christian, to go from that place of infancy into adulthood, you need to learn something. You need to grow up. You need to develop a vocabulary. You need to have a frame of reference. You you, you need to grow in your knowledge of God. You need to be transformed in the renewing of your mind. And so you spend many, many years, decades, unseating a lifetime of human viewpoint and replacing it with divine viewpoint. But that creates a fortress in your soul. It creates... uh, um, a strength in your soul that enables you to resist that conforming pressure that the world puts upon you, and the world will try to force you into its mold. Make no mistake about that. None whatsoever. Pressure is a tactic of Satan that he employs. But this living by faith means that we are renovating our thinking, that we are being transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now, you could spend some time on this verse right here, because often we, 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 we live in the world, we live in a physical world, but we get this idea that somehow we war according to the uh, programs of this world. And uh, even though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Notice here, for the weapons... And Christians are armed. Listen, we're going to spend a few lessons talking about the armor of God. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. For the destruction of fortresses. And I think that what Paul is arguing here has to do with fortresses that are constructed in our minds. These constructs that we have in our thinking uh, that affect our perception of the world and how we think and operate but are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Notice what he says in verse 5. Excuse me. 
we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, every thought captive, because our thoughts can run away. Our thoughts can run away from us. I was having a conversation with a friend recently, and we were talking about how uh, if you're hurt by somebody, if you're done an injustice, if there's some pain that's inflicted upon you, it can create a, a, a negative reference point in your memory. And it, when you think about that, it can create within you a sense of injustice because you've been wronged. And the proclivity of the sin nature is to retaliate. Vengeance is mine, say is Steve. I will repay. You know, I'm going to pay them back. And so people begin to think in terms of, uh, of revenge motivation. And so you, you, begin to, uh, mem- you begin to reflect on these memories, these past hurts or whatever, these injustices that were done, and you get angry. And in your mind, you can create, if that thought gets away from you, if you let that run away from you, uh, then in your mind, you can create these little mental scenarios, these little mental productions in your mind. We all do it, and we cast ourselves in a certain light, and we cast other people in a light, and we create a situation. But you can, you can create this little mental scenario in which you can basically exact your revenge upon that person. You can talk them down, you can beat them down, you can, you know, pummel them, you know, choke them out, whatever, and then revive them and repeat the process. And that's that seeking that revenge. Now, the Bible tells us to love our enemies. It tells us to pray for those who persecute us. And this is done by faith, not feelings, let me tell you. I know what feelings want to do. Feelings feelings want to go with that revenge. But we have to operate by the standard of God's Word. And so, anyway, I was talking with a friend about it. But what happens is if your thoughts get away from you, you can you can let your thoughts go in that direction, and so you begin to uh, begin to uh, harm this person in your mind, or maybe think of ways that you can harm them at work or at life, or you know, in the neighborhood, whatever it happens to be, whoever, wherever. But we run these little scenarios through our mind, and our thoughts can run away from us. So we have to we have to catch those thoughts. We have to catch them. And we have to bring them back and rein them in. And we have to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Don't let your thoughts get away from you. Uh, and so what we were talking about it, because what happens is, is you can, you can bring those thoughts and you can identify it and you can say, okay, that's a sinful thought, right? I'm not loving my enemy. I'm hating them. And that's a form of mental murder, right? So you don't want to do that. And Romans 12, uh, he tells us to pray for those who perse- persecute us, to, to bless them and do not curse them. He says, do not seek your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. So in that moment, you want to you want to put the matter in the Supreme Court of Heaven. You want to put it in the Lord's hands and you say, Lord, I trust you. And if you want to if you want to punish them, God, that's up to you. But if you want to show them grace, that's up to you. Because Lord, no, you show me grace when I wasn't all always friendly and sweet and lovely, and you gave me grace. And, but you just simply put the matter in the Lord's hands. You trust God, so you let go of it. So you bring your thoughts into captivity, and you deal with the matter. But then what happens? Ten minutes later, you start having that memory. You start thinking about it, and your thoughts want to start getting away from you again. And you have to lay hold of that thought. You've got to bring them into captivity, bring them back into obedience to Christ. And literally, you can repeat that process a dozen times in a day. You can repeat that process over years. And failure to do so means that people will be locked into bitterness. They will be locked into mental forms of murder or hatred or anxiety or fear, whatever it happens to be. If we don't bring our thoughts into captivity, then Satan wins. He cripples us. He shuts us down. And so again, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. By the way, I gave a lesson on biblical self-talk, a video a few months ago. I think you'll enjoy that. So again, living by faith is the basis for renovating our thinking, and we must have our thinking renovated. And this must help advance us to spiritual maturity because God wants us to grow up. He wants us to grow up. He wants us to be mature adults, spiritually speaking, in our thinking, in our words, and in our actions. And He has done this by equipping us. He has given certain gifted persons to the church, persons with the ability to communicate uh, His Word and His will. Ephesians 4 says, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. I think there's four gifts listed, listed here, actually. I think the pastors and teachers is a hyphenated gift. In the Greek, it's poimenos, kai didaskalos, and the kai there, I think, functions as a hendiades. 
which would make it, a, in effect, kind of like a hyphenated gift, a pastor hyphen teacher. Uh, and though there is a gift of teaching, uh, not all teachers are pastors, but all pastors are teachers, by the way. And I believe I have the gift of pastor teacher, and that's why I love to study and why I love to get in the Word and why I love to talk. Love to talk. I'll talk about God's Word, that is. But notice these gifted persons with this communication gift uh, ability to, to speak to the church. It is, it, there's, a, there's a purpose for it for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of God, uh, of the Son of God, to a mature man. You see, God wants us to grow up. He wants us to become mature adults, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the uh, fullness of Christ. And as a result, we are no longer to be children. No longer to be children, tossed here and there and uh, by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine and by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up. See, again, this is, this is what he wants from us. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show yourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17 says, All Scripture is inspired by God. Literally, all Scripture is God-breathed. And it's profitable. To what end? For teaching? For reproof? Because we are wrong in many ways, in many uh, places and times, and we need to be reproved. And for correction? For training in righteousness. Do you want to live the righteous life? I hope you do. The Word of God is going to be uh, the foundation for that, that all Scripture is profitable for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. 1 Peter 2, 2 says, Like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation, so that by it you may grow. And 2 Peter 3.18 tells us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So God wants us to grow up. So again, I know we're jumping into uh, categories of Satan's strategies, and this is some introductory material, but I'm just trying to lay some foundation here for how we are able to be effective to uh, not fall into Satan's uh, uh, tactics to understand how he attacks. Now, the purpose of this study is to learn how Satan attacks, Ephesians 6.11, so that we will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now, our enemy, the devil, is a brilliant commander who has manufactured schemes or strategies. This translates the Greek word methodeia. We get the word uh, methods from it. Uh, but it translates the Greek word methodeia. But he's manufactured schemes or strategies that he employs against the human race and God's people in particular, because we pose the biggest threat to him. By the way, the same term methodeia is used of false teachers who engage in deceitful scheming, deceitful scheming, in order to trap immature Christians with false doctrine. William MacDonald states, quote, The devil has various stratagems, discouragement, frustration, confusion, moral failure, and doctrinal error. He knows our weakest point and names for it. If he cannot disable us by one method, he will try for another, end quote. He's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. And so I'm not going to hit, um, he mentions things in here such as discouragement. Uh, I, I, by the way, all Christians have areas where they struggle. All Christians have areas where they struggle. Some struggle with pride, some struggle with lust, some struggle with fear, with worry, with doubt. Some struggle with anger. Uh, I know believers who have a problem with anger. Uh, people, Christians, uh, everybody has an area of weakness. And we must be careful to extend grace to other believers. Uh, because, you know, just because their sin is different than our sin uh, doesn't mean that somehow we're better than them or worse than them. But we must understand uh, that everybody struggles. And I personally have struggled throughout my life with discouragement. And I don't know why that is. I've never quite fully wrapped my brain around that. But, but discouragement seems to hit me. And frustration, too. Uh, not confusion, not moral failure, not doctrinal error, but discouragement. And I guess maybe that's why this quote kind of jumped off the page at me. 
And I'll tell you, uh, God has repeatedly sent encouraging people into my life, and I'm encouraged by His Word, uh, to get into His Word and to study and to be reminded of these things. And I have to be reminded. These things have to constantly be brought up in my, in my mind. And I have to bring my own thoughts into captivity. But there are times where God's people have encouraged me tremendously, and they still do. And by the way, we're commanded to do that. We're commanded to encourage one another. Why? Because life can be discouraging. And people encourage me through comments that they make, I had somebody call me just a few days ago, and she blessed me tremendously by some of the things that she told me over the phone. And I walked, I moved from a place of discouragement to encouragement. I didn't even see it coming. Uh, But she was really a blessing to me. And people have encouraged me uh, in a number of ways. I've been, I've had people uh, make contributions uh, to ministry, which has afforded me the opportunity to buy like the recording equipment uh, that I use for online. It helps pay for the the websites, uh, you know, the blog and the other, you know, my podcast website. But I'm encouraged by people's kindness, by their words, by their actions, by their by their giving. Uh, but Satan can use these things to try to defeat us. So again, quoting from McDonald here, that the devil has various stratagems, discouragement, frustration, confusion, moral failure, and doctrinal error. He knows our weakest point and aims for it. And if he cannot disable us by one method, he will try for another. Remember when uh, Satan even tempted Jesus in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. You can read those accounts. But Satan came at Jesus, and when Jesus uh, resisted him by quoting the Scripture, Satan didn't give up and walk away. He came back at another attack. He came at him a second time. Jesus resisted him a second time, again quoting Scripture. Did did Satan give up? No. He came at him a third time. Because that's what Satan does. If he cannot disable us by one method, he'll try for another. Now, ultimately, Satan was resisted, and Christ did not sin, and went his entire life without sin. He was, in fact, a sinless person and a sinless substitutionary sacrifice upon the cross in our place. But the point that if Satan cannot disable us by one method, he will try for another. And that's important to understand as well, that Satan is persistent. Satan has many demons and carnally-minded people on his side, and he fights dirty. He fights dirty. We're called to operate by principles of truth, and we cannot abandon the ground of Christ. Don't don't miss this. We cannot abandon the ground of Christ. For for us to step away from Scripture is automatic defeat. It's automatic. Because if we step off the ground of God's truth and His Word, then what are we stepping off onto? Uh, Sinking sand. Unsteady ground. We must remain standing upon the ground of God's Word. And so, uh, Satan will fight dirty. He will fight dirty. Now, as Christians, we don't go hunting for the devil. This is another point. Uh, Rather, we stand firm against his attacks when he comes. We stand firm against his attacks when he comes. Uh, I'm going to read this uh, last paragraph here before we actually jump into the strategy set forth here. So even though we've hit on this to some degree, this has been a lot of introductory material, but very necessary. So knowing Satan's strategies enables us to identify an attack and to defend ourselves by taking up the armor of God. And we'll, again, we'll spend at least two lessons on the armor of God. That's, that's in, the, in the near future. Learning God's Word and living by faith is the key to victory. Quoting from Warren Wearsby, he says, quote, Everybody in this world lives by faith. The difference between the Christian and the unconverted person is not the fact of faith, but the object of faith. And he's absolutely right on that. He goes on to say, The unsaved person trusts himself and other humans. The Christian trusts God. It is your faith in God that is the secret of victory and ministry. End quote. And he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. All right, so we're going to call it quits here, and uh, and then in our next lesson, we're going to come back and we're going to jump into uh, the first of Satan's strategies, and that is his promotion of sinful pride. So I hope this video has been helpful up to this point. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and call it quits here. I do appreciate your comments. Uh, 
So feel free to hit the like button below and leave comments if you have any comments or questions. I do respond to those and I do appreciate those, by the way. So thank you very much. I hope you've been blessed and we'll leave off here until we gather again. Thank you.